And once again, we thank God for another opportunity uh, to come and Bible study and to receive that which he has for us uh, through the wonders of his word. And the wonderful thing that we know about this, God said his word is tried, his word is true. And so we thank him for it. Amen. We thank him for it in all that he does. Amen. 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 And so as we get ready to go into our prior time and in our Bible study time for tonight, we ask everybody to get their Bibles and get their pens, their paper, and uh, whatever wet method they're going to use to take their notes and record as what God gives to us to give unto you. Amen. And so get your Bibles that we said before and let us prepare to go forth in our Bible study for tonight. And uh, we're going to have three foundational scriptures that we're going to walk through tonight. Uh, two Old Testament and one New Testament. Uh, but I think it's going to be something that's going to give us encouragement and help us to understand and reflect on who we are and whose we are. And to help us to realize that in the midst of these days and times, God has kept his promise, and his promise shall come to pass, and that which he has said regarding his children, he shall do. Amen. Amen. And so just to give us encouragement, which we want to deal with to in our lesson tonight, and we just want to share this with everyone, and share this with the people of God, the children of God, the believers in Christ Jesus, students of the Holy Ghost. I just want you to remember this. It hasn't been delayed. It's being delivered in God's due time. I'll say this again. It hasn't been delayed. It's being delivered in God's due time. Now, I know some may say, well, preacher, how can you say it's not, it hasn't been delayed? I think it's been delayed. I've been waiting on it for a while. Well, I'm just telling you what God's word says. God says it hasn't been delayed. He says it's being delivered in his due time. Amen. Amen. And so our foundational scriptures tonight, as we go through our lesson this afternoon, this evening, uh, first scripture is going to be coming from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we're going to be reading verse 1. It's going to be our first foundational scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says this. And this is a familiar passage of scripture for us. For those who have uh, been in the presence of God in worship. And in Bible studies and Sunday school and other places. We've heard it said oftentimes. To everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And then turn with us and move to the book of Habakkuk, Mount of Prophet Habakkuk. And this is a familiar passage of scripture as well. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. And many are probably familiar with this because at the beginning of the year, uh, many of the congregations were going around looking for magazines and, and, and documents and that type of thing. Uh, and many people were saying they were making their vision boards uh, to prepare for what they were going to do for that year. And understanding what God is dealing with. But understand that is to be, do, to be done so that we can have an understanding that God shall do what he's going to do. But also to help us get our focus on the fact that God shall provide that God shall perform, and that God shall persist and progress in everything that he has for us to do and what he has done for us and will do for us. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3 says this, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. 
And another way of expressing that when he says that it means it will not delay. It will not be delayed. So that's what it says. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And then we've got the final passage of Scripture. It's going to be in the New Testament epistle, the book of Second Peter, chapter 3. And verse 8, 2 Peter, chapter 3, at verse 8. And this is what 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 8 says. But beloved of beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. I'm going to say this once again, 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 8 says this, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Amen. And so as we said before, we want to talk to you from the lesson from this, this standpoint. It hasn't been delayed. It's being delivered in God to due time. It hasn't been delayed. Is being delivered in God's due time. And so for those of us who have been uh, in the church and have gone to church and heard what the old saints and the matriarchs and patriarchs of the church would say, it was a statement that they would often say. And I often heard as a child as I grew up. And I remember hearing them say it. He may not come when you want him. But he's always on time. And, and that, that, that's something that we look at now, especially in this generation. Uh, people will say a lot of time, well, when and how long? Why is it going to take so long? Or why does it take so long? And a lot of times we have to say that's, that's because, of, like they say, this microwave society because we are able to do things so quickly. We can go to the microwave and, and, and put in a time and cook the food in a minute or two minutes or three minutes or four minutes. We can go on our phone and we can look up information in a matter of seconds. We can call somebody in a matter of seconds. We can Google it, or we can go on Facebook, or YouTube, or TikTok, or, or Facebook, whatever we want to do, and we can find things quickly. And so it puts us sometimes in a way and in a place where if it seems like something's taking too long, we get frustrated, we get perturbed, and we say, well, why is it taking so long? Uh, well, a lot of times, as God says, it's good for us to be able to wait and he said, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And so even the songwriter said this. He said, he's an on-time God. And he said, yes, he is. But we must come to this realization, and this is the realization that we must come to. God does not do, deliver, and function according to me and you time. God is not on our time. God is not on our time. And so we have to understand this. God does, he delivers, and functions according to his due time. So, so, so God is not looking at things from the basis of where we say, well, Lord, you ought to be here by 9 o'clock. Or, Lord, if you don't get here by 9.30, well, I'm gone. I'm leaving. I'm, I'm giving you 30 minutes to get here, Lord. It, it don't work like that. Uh, we can't tuck God, pull God Rush God, we can't do those things with God. And we can't treat God like we treat men. We can't treat God like the things in this world because God does not work in that manner. God does, have to, not have to, does not have to respond. God does not have to do. God does not have to do anything for us because he is God. The very fact that he gave us life, the very fact that he breathed into man so that man could be a living soul, man have ought to have an understanding to say, well, wait on God and spend time with God from that standpoint of saying, well, Lord, I need to spend more time with you versus, Lord, I'll give you some time when I get time. And so we have to understand when we treat God in that manner, it's not that God is stopping anything. We're preventing it from happening. And so we can't say that God is delaying it, that God is slow, that God is procrastinating. We determine whether or not we are going to be able to receive what God already has set for us because 
God already has established a time that we're going to receive it. And we have to look at this from the standpoint. Everything that God has set for us to receive, everything that God has set for him to do, God does it according to his time, not according to man's time. Now, we look at this and we talk about where being tarried, and we look at that word delivered. And that was a word the old people used to use all the time. You used to always hear them say that word tarry. And so what does tarry mean? In the scripture it says, though it tarry, that's what it says in the back of 2 and 3, it says, though it tarry, he's talking about division in this case. That means though it waits and though it moves slowly. Now understand, it said though it waits and though the vision moves slowly. That means that vision is moving at the speed at the time that God is set for it to move. Not for the time we set for it to move. Everything moves according to God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Everything revolves around the center that God has set for. Even in the universe, everything is set on a certain time frame. Everything is set, even in this standpoint. The way the universe is structured, Everything revolves around the sun. And, 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 and notice, God said, you got to go through my son. Jesus said, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the door. You got to go to me. You got to come through me. Every planet, everything, the moon, and everything, the, 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 the planets revolve around the sun. That's the way God set it up. And so everything has a certain speed. That speed does not increase. That speed does not slow down. Everything is set forth in this time. Just had an eclipse a couple of weeks ago. All of those things where it just happened, where the moon moved in between the earth and the sun, all of those things, when you see these things happening, these things are not something that is a surprise to God. All these things are set forth in their time, even so much so that the astronomers understand that they can look at the revolution and based on the set time of everything, they are able to tell us that that eclipse is going to happen at this time on this day during this month. Now notice, they didn't say the exact time. They gave you a range. It's going to happen between this time and this time. Only God knew the exact time of when it was going to occur. Now, the other part of that scripture says, it will not tarry. So you're going, well, where is it? Well, will it tarry? Will, will it not tarry? In the first instance, God says this. That means, though it wait, though the vision moves slow, which means it has not stopped. It has not been delayed. He's saying it will not be late, it will not be left back, and it will not be delayed. So we're looking at this from a different perspective than what God is. Everything that God has set in motion is moving in the frame that God has set it to move. Now, we talked about this, and we talked about being delivered, and when will it be delivered? That term delivered means this. It means to be brought. It means to be carried, it means to be distributed, it means to be sent, it means to be transported. And so we're all familiar with delivery. We all, we order things, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Walmart, every, everything, you can order everything now. You got, you got DoorDash, you got Grub, you can order everything and have it delivered to you. Pizza can be delivered to you. But all those things are set forth at one point, what was it, uh, Domino's used to say, if it's not delivered in 30 minutes or less, we'll give you your money back. They don't say that no more because they don't have that kind of control over time because they can, there are many things that can come that can occur that will cause them not to be able to deliver it in 30 minutes. But God can tell you he's going to give it at a certain time. And when he says it's going to come, it's going to come. Now, when we look at this thing about delivery and when something is delivered, it's all based upon a viewpoint. It's all based upon where you are sitting, where you are stationed, where you are positioned. And so we have to look at it like this when we talk about viewpoints on delivery and when things are going to be delivered. Man and God have different viewpoints on delivery. So what do you mean different viewpoints? God is on high in eternity. We are here on earth. In eternity, there is no such thing as time. It's just forever. On earth, man operates in the realm of time. God operates in the realm of eternity. Now, man's viewpoint of delivery is based on his designated 
an estimated earthly hour and place. Man speaks on things in terms of hours and places. That's what time is, hours and places. You talk about a flight, they say the ETA, the estimated time of arrival. They say the plane is going to take off at 940. It's estimated that it's going to arrive wherever at 1035. So depending on what's going on when you're on that, on that flight, the pilot's going to come across and say, if we're getting ready to leave at 940, based on the weather reports and the forecast, we should arrive there by 1045. Now, what's going to happen? While he's in the midst of that flight, if he starts to run into turbulence, he runs into roadblocks, he runs into problems, he'll come on and tell you, we're adjusting your arrival time. It's either going to be later or it's going to be quicker. And so in the middle of that flight, as they're going on that flight, they will come over the intercom and say, well, based upon the flight, everything is clear. We're just letting you know the arrival time. We said it will be at 1045, but estimated at the rate we're going right now, we're going to get there at 1015. And so they're still adjusting it based upon the things that they are dealing with, it, based upon the earthly environment. So if the pilot is adjusting it based on that, the pilot has to adjust it based on the things around him. God is basing everything set on what he's established it to be. And so you're not looking at him saying, well, oh, uh, maybe I might come here, or maybe it might be at this time. God can tell you when it's going to be. And that's why Jesus said, told the disciples, they said, when are the, the, the last days, when are you coming back? When are these things going to happen? And he said, those things are not for you to know. He said, don't worry yourself about that. He said, well, Lord, can you tell us when it's going to be? He said, I can't tell you when it's going to be. He said, if any man comes and tells you he knows the exact time, the exact place that I'm going to return, or the exact time or the exact place that God is going to move in this manner, he said, get away from it. He said, because the only person that knows those times in that manner is God himself. So when the time for Jesus to return comes, God is going to look to his son and tell his son, it's time for you to return. In the same manner, in Revelation, he's going to look to the angels. He said, the time has come for the last days to end. So all those things are in God's control. Now, from God's viewpoint of delivery, his is based upon his divine and established eternal order and promises. I'll say this again. God's viewpoint, which is from glory, which is from on high, is based upon his divine and established eternal order and promises. God knew when the world would begin. God knows when the world is going to end. God knows when each one of us was going to be born. The doctor would have to kind of say, well, he's going to be born on this day. Possibly. I'm giving you a two-week window. Could be before, could be after. God knew exactly when. God knows exactly when we're going to leave here. Only he knows that. And so when you look at this, God has set forth everything according to his established order and to his promises. Now understand this thing. Man can get in there and start to try to do things, and man can mess up time on earth and mess up things that will be done in time on earth, but that's not going to impact God. This is what we have in a situation. This is going on right now with everything with 45 and all this stuff with the politicians, everything that's going on in Israel, everything that's going on in Iran. You have people who say that they are so-called Christian folk and that they are believers that think that they can quicken the time that Jesus is going to come back by causing wars, disturbances, and these type of things in Israel. And a lot of these people live in the United States. They live in different countries. They think that if they can cause a certain type of disturbance, to start, cause race wars, and cause these things to come forth, that Jesus already talked about in the Bible, if they can get all those things in motion, then they could make Jesus come back when they want him to come back. Not going to be. Because God has already set that time forth already. Now, there are scriptural examples talking about how God has already established everything and it's based upon viewpoint. How man looks at it from the viewpoint of time, but God looks at it from the viewpoint of eternity and his promises. We look in the book of uh, Exodus and we look at the children of Israel. It talks about how they endured the bondage of Egypt and how the children of Israel prayed and they, and they pondered 
from their earthly viewpoint of how long would God delay answering their prayers for a deliverer and deliverance. Now understand what we just said. They looked at it from a viewpoint based on their time and their suffering. They were saying, well, how long will God delay answering us? How long will God allow us to go through this? Why hadn't God answered us? Why hadn't God sent us a deliverer? They were trying to get God to answer on their time. But they didn't realize. They didn't remember. They didn't understand. God had already addressed what, what they were going through before they went through it. God had already established the time on how long they were going to go through it. And he already had set the time frame of when he was going to respond. His viewpoint was based on divine, eternal order and promises. This is what he said to Abraham, and this is what's in, recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, this is what God said to Abraham. This is what he said to Abram. God said to Abram, know for sure that your descendants, now notice what he said, he didn't say my people. <laughs> Once again, notice how God spoke. He said, your descendants will be strangers living temporarily in a land of Egypt that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. Now, in Genesis, God had already said this was going to happen to them. He said how long they would go through it. He said what the time limit would be before he responded to bring them out of it. And so in verse 14, he says, but on that nation whom your descendants will serve, I will bring judgment. And after the, afterward, they will come out of that land with great possessions. So he said beforehand, he said, not only am I going to deliver them out of the land, but when they leave, they're not going to leave empty-handed. They're going to leave with everything that they need to worship me, to build a tabernacle to worship me, and to be in a place where they can walk and build themselves and get in a situation where I'm going to bring them to a land of milk and honey where they're going to learn how to worship me and be my people. And notice that at that point, be my people. Now, notice he said, your descendants. But he indicated he was doing this because by the time all this would be over, they would be his people. Now, this is what it says in Exodus chapter 2, in verses 23 and 25, and I'm reading the New Living Translation. This is what it said. Remember, in Genesis 15, God told Abraham, they're going to be there 400 years. In Exodus chapter 2, it says this. Years passed. And the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help. And their cries rose up to God. God heard their groaning. And he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice it said, they were calling. But it said he remembered what he told Abraham. and said it's going to be 400 years in their time. And it said he looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. When God's clock showed that it was 400 years, God moved. Not when man decided it was time for God to move. God moved in the set time and according to the promise and the covenant and the agreement that he made with Abraham. So he kept his promise to Abraham in saying what was going to happen and what he was going to do. Now, when we talk about due time delivery, it's based upon certain factors. And this is similar to what we deal with when you're dealing with getting orders sent from wherever. When you're getting it sent to you, wherever you go online to order it and have it sent and delivered, you go through these same processes. But this is what we're dealing with today when we talk about due time delivery and how God is dealing with it and how we have to look at it. It's based on these factors. Availability, preparation, location, the mode of the request, then the time, then there's the assurance of progress of delivery statement, and then there's confirmation. I'll say it again. Availability, preparation, location, mode of the request, the time, we talk about due time and what it means, Assurance that there's going to be progress of the delivery and finally confirmation of the delivery. And so we're going to walk through these 
First, we deal with the availability. We talk about availability, we're dealing with this. You're dealing with there has to be availability of the item to be delivered. So if the item is not there, it can't be delivered. And so it must be accessible, it must be easy to get to, it must be in stock, and it must be on hand. So if you go online and want to say Amazon, whatever you want to be, and you want to order a chair or whatever, and you go and look for it, and if they look at it and they say, well, it's on back order, or it's no longer available, that means you can't get it. Or if it's on back order, you can order it, but you're going to have to wait because it may be a while before you get it. And so everything is based upon availability. You also have to look at it from this standpoint. The availability of the person to whom the item will be delivered. So not only does the item have to be available, the person who is going to be delivered to has to be available. So if you order the item but you're not available to get it, you won't get it. And so availability is necessary. So the person has to be on hand, they have to be nearby, and they have to be within reach. Now, next thing we talked about is has to be preparation. That means the person must be prepared. That must mean they have to be able, they have to be put in the right order, and they have to be set up for delivery. The word they use now, you have to be in the right queue. And so the queue means you're going to either be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, or to put it like this way, if you want to go to motor vehicles and there's a lot of people in there, what do they do? They give you a number, which means you're in the queue. And so you ask, well, how long is it going to be? They say, well, you got 200 ahead of you. And they're either moving slow today, so it might take a while, or they're moving fast today, so it may not take as long. But once you're in that queue, you don't get there until your number is called. Now, Preparation is key. In order for you to have to be able to receive the delivery or to be delivered, it's necessary that this be fulfilled. And the one thing that has to be fulfilled when it's dealing with the people of God, you have to be a child of God. Look at what it says in uh, John chapter 1 and verse 11 through 13. This is what John wrote. In John chapter 1, verse 11 through 13. And he discusses who is prepared to receive deliveries from God? And so you can't get upset and say, well, why can't I get what you're getting from God? Well, if you aren't prepared, if you aren't available, everybody doesn't get from God. Those who are of God, for God, and in God, get from God. And so this is what it says. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power or authority to become the sons of the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's why when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he made the statement, he said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus thought he was talking about the physical rebirth. He said, well, how can I go back into my mother's womb and be reborn? He said, I'm not talking about that kind of birth. I'm talking about the birth of the spirit. It's a water. It's a baptism. It's a rebirth through me, through God. It's a rebirth that can only be obtained through Jesus Christ. So you have to be prepared. In other words, being prepared means you have placed yourself in a position. You have received Jesus. Therefore, because you have received Jesus, God will allow you to receive whatever he has to deliver that is set forth for you to receive through Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say? God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So if you say, well, I want that, Lord, but I don't want Jesus, well, don't expect to get his riches. It's through Jesus that you get those riches. So in order for you to receive the delivery, there has to be the preparation through Jesus Christ. Now, next thing that's important for the delivery is the location. What was the song? I think it was uh, Dr. John. I was in the right place. <laughs> but it was in the wrong time. If, you, <laughs> if you're not where you need to be, you're not going to receive it. If you're not where you need to be, you're not going to receive it. And so the thing is this. You're talking about location. That means from whom and from where is the item being delivered. So 
the delivery, everything comes from God. So if you're not in line with God, you don't get a delivery. And if you're not in line with God, you don't get delivered. Now, you have to look at it from this standpoint also. To who and to where is the item being delivered? Those are questions that all Amazon, all these places, they ask these questions. They need to know your address. They need to know your zip code. And they say they need to know if they can deliver it to your house, in front of your door, under your carport, or do they want, do you, not even to the standpoint, do you want it delivered to Walgreens? Do you want it delivered to another place where you think it's safe for it to be delivered so you can go and pick it up? Location and delivery, everything is necessary. Location impacts delivery. So if you don't have a location, or if it's a location that's considered to be a terrible location where there's thieves and robbers, they would tell you, we don't deliver in that area. We're not going to drop your package off there. But, I, but that's where I live. You may live there, but we're not, we not delivering it to you. And so if it's like that with Amazon and these other delivery services, why would you think that you can live any kind of way, do anything, and then say, well, God, deliver this blessing to me? It don't work that way. It just doesn't. How do we know it's important? to be in the right place in the right location? When you look in the passage of James chapter four, chap chapter four, verse eight, this is what James chapter four, verse eight says. This is why you're, this is the location we have to be in to be received the deliverance from God and be delivered by God. This is what James chapter four, verse eight says. It says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. God's not going to force himself on anybody. He could, but he won't. God has given everybody free will. And I saw something, and somebody had like a little phrase. They said, well, uh, you can't blame God because you're in hell. You made the choice of where you wanted to be. Or as he put it this way, you chose who you wanted to be close to. And so if you're walking in the wheel in the ways of the world, that means you want to be close to the people that walk in the wheel in the way of the world. And God said those are his enemies. And said because those people deal with Satan, Satan deals with the world. So if you deal with him and you deal with his people, that's where you're going to be close. And that's where those people go. So in order to receive the deliverance and the deliverance from God, you got to be close to God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. When the people were in the wilderness and they came out to hear Jesus and Jesus had preached to the people and he said it was in a desert place and they, Jesus told the disciples to feed the people not to send them away hungry. <laughs> you, you have to look at this thing. Those people were in a place where they were close to town but Jesus was closer. How do we say this? The disciples said, Lord, Send them into the nearby town and let them go get something to eat. He said, no, don't do that to them. They're close here. You feed them. Don't send them away hungry. He said, but Lord, we don't have nothing to feed them. What do we have available? There's a lad in the camp, two fish and five barley loaves. Bring it to me. So what did they have to do to deliver the food to the people? They had to go to the people, but they had to continue to come back to Jesus to receive it. So if you walk away from Jesus and you're away from Jesus, you can't receive what God has put in his hands for you to receive. It's simple as that. So say, well, I, I don't go to church as much as I used to. I don't, I, don't, I, you know, I don't pray. I don't do all that stuff like I used to. And then all of a sudden you start to run into issues and all these other things. Why are these things happening to me? Well, Lord, why aren't you helping me? Well, you stepped away from him. He didn't step away from you. And so remain close to him. And he'll take care of those things. Now, this is another important thing. How do you get the delivery? There has to be a mode of request. In order for something to be delivered, you have to request it. It's not just going to show up at your house. If it shows up at your house and you didn't request it, 
That means it's not yours. You're taking something else that belonged to somebody else. Now, mode of request is used for delivery. Either you're going to use it through the postal service, through the regular mail, or nowadays it's electronically. It's either going to be emailed or downloaded. When it comes to the people of God and the spiritual mode of request, this is what we use. Knee mail. That means you get down on your knees and you call it. Prayer is your mode of request. That's why prayer is so important. If you don't pray, how can you get a request to God? If you don't ask him, he said, you receive not and you have not because you ask not. And you get mad at God because you didn't ask God to, for, his, for his help. So in order to have whatever you need delivered to you, there's a request that has to be made, and that request has to be made through prayer. Not only does that request have to be made through, through prayer, just like in anything else, when you make a request, what do they do? They want to make sure that you confirm it. How do you confirm it? Either you're going to make that payment, or you're going to sign it to say that, yes, I've made this request. If a request is to come forth for whatever you order, they'll even send you an email. Did you make this request? If you made this request, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to reply. But if you did not make this request, let us know right now because somebody is trying to get something through you and through your name illegally. They're trying to steal it. Now, how do we know the motive request is important and how do we know it has to be through the name of Jesus? This is what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verses 23 and 24. This is what Jesus told his disciples. This is what Jesus said. But before he prepared to leave here, he said this. This is what he told them. He said, I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. And it's the amplified version of the scripture. You haven't done this before. He said, ask using my name, and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. So he's saying, if you don't want to be upset by why I'm not getting it, well, ask me, and I'll have it done for you. You can ask, ask the Father directly and say, Father, I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus. And he says, then you will receive it, and you will not only receive it, but you shall also receive the joy from God. Now, next thing we talked about, it's the delivery time. And he always had this, well, how long is it going to take? Well, it's based upon how you want it sent. Do you want it fast? Do you want it normal? Do you want it quick? All those things are set forth. And so when you look at any delivery system, this is generally what they do. And they talk about delivering the item. It's going to be slow, <laughs> which is going to be either 14 to 21 days. It's going to be standard, which is 10 to 14 days, which is not much difference. Or it's going to be express which is generally 7 to 14 days, priority, which is 3 to 7 days. And, and we're talking about with the post office, and we're talking about with other orders. Next day, which really isn't next day all the time, because it depends on whether you do it on a Friday or Saturday. If you do it on a Friday, next day going to probably be Monday, because <laughs> a lot of them don't deliver on Saturday and Sunday. So next day is usually 1 to 3 days. Overnight is one day. Overnight is one day, or emergency is now or as soon as possible. That means as quick as they can get it to somebody, they're going to get it to you. They can't tell you when it's going to be, but they can say it's coming that quick. As soon as somebody can get to it, it'll get to you. Now, the world and the word's reference of time differs. The way the world looks at time, the way the word speaks of time are different. The world reference of time speaks in terms of a year, month, day, hour, minute, or second. Word reference of time speaks in terms of a how or when. And that's specifically when it talks about in Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. This is how the word speaks of time. It says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Notice, notice how I did it? Everything is linked back to God and eternity. Everything. 
So in the word, everything based upon the delivery system is an eternal tie to God. But in the world, is an earthly tie to man. And so understand this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Man is temporary. Man lives for so long and man passes away. God is forever. Now, the word reference of time speaks in terms of how and when. And we see this in several scriptures. We saw it in Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. And understand that's what he's talking about. But we also see it pointed out in a sense when we talk about in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And that's where it says, do not let this one fact escape you. And this is the, the, the Amplified Bible version, what I read from King James. Beloved, know this, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So you can't equate God and time and our time together. So you can't say, well, Lord, I need this in, Lord, I, I, Lord, I need this in three days. Oh. Uh, that's you, you saying when you need it. That's, that's not God. And so you have to understand this thing. That God has already had everything set forth in his options and his work, his will, and his way. Let's get back to this. When you're dealing with God, when you're dealing with God, God looks at things in his manner. God is not looking at it from the time frame of man. He's not looking at it from the time frame of when you think it should happen. God is looking at it from his time frame. So, when we consider what God has said, and we consider what God is doing, God deals with it like this. When God talks about what he's going to do, and he's talking about due time and reference time, God is dealing with it from the standpoint like this. Due time, in the biblical context, implies and pertains to God's own time, God's private and separate time, God's proper time, God's home time. That means as he sees things in heaven, God's business time. When you look at due time, we're talking about God's measure of time, God's portion of time, God's fixed and definite time, God's decisive waited for time, his opportune and seasonal time, his right time, and his limited period of time. So understand this. When you look back in the book of Genesis, it talks about what was going on in the days of Noah, how man had became evil, and how God looked down and it was doing an evaluation of man. And God made a, made a decision that he needed to cleanse the, the earth and rid the earth of man because man had become so evil. God did that in his time. He did the evaluation. He looked up on it. And so that wasn't done in terms Man's time, it was done in his time, but he did do this. He gave Noah 120 years to build the ark, but also to preach to the people to tell them it's going to rain. And the rain came down in his time. And so after God knew that, that Noah had built the ark, the ark was already built, and he was preaching to the people over those years, when the time came, God let Noah see this, the animals start coming to Noah. Noah didn't have to call the animals. God told animals, head to the ark. <laughs> and when Noah saw the animals coming to the ark, Noah knew God can set forth the time. Now, when we're dealing with this, the word gives reference to due time, and it speaks of it in terms of how and when. And when we talk about how and when, this is what we're talking about. Here are some scriptures that point to it. We already talked about Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. But we also look at it from the standpoint, we look at and write these scriptures down, children. Leviticus chapter 26 and verses 3 through 5. Leviticus chapter 26 and verses 3 through 5. And this is key in determining whether what you seek is delivered in God's due time. Amen? Do what it says in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 3 through 5. It says, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments 
and do them. Then I will give you rain in due season. This is what God is telling his children. This is what God is conveying to Moses for the people. That I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land in safety. All of this is based upon obedience and heeding God's word. Now we said, stop looking, listen to God's word and to God. The other scripture that deals with due time is Psalm 145 and verse 15. This is what it is, Psalm 145 and verse 15. This is what it says in Psalm 145, verse 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Those who wait upon God, those who seek God, those who are obedient to God, those who show respect to God, those who are fearful of God, God will give them what they need in his due time. But the thing is like, this is the important thing. That means in this due time, you won't get to the point where you are hungry to the point where you don't know how you're going to make it. Because God's going to make a way somehow. That's why the old people would say that. God will make a way somehow. The Shulamite woman and her son, when the prophet went there, she said, I'm about to cook this bread, and you just last me, and after this, my son and I are going to lay down and die. He said, cook it, give me some first, and then you eat yours. Obedience. She did what he asked. She cooked it, gave him a portion of the meal, and asked, he asked her, do you have any vessels in your house? She, had, she said, I only had this one vessel that's left. He said, go into your surrounding neighborhood and bring back every vessel you can bring back that you can find. And as long as she brought vessels back into the house, he took the same small vessel that she had and started to pour out oil into the vessel. When the last neighbor or the last person brought the last vessel, the oil stopped flowing. So understand, as long as you are being obedient to God and his word and his will and his way, everything that you need in his due time will be given to you. Now, also look at this. Book of Romans, chapter 5, and verse 6. Romans, chapter 5, and verse 6. This is what he says. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So, so understand this. When we are walking in sin, to walk in sin means you are walking in weakness. But the world will tell you just the opposite. The world will try to tell you that a person that, that's being walking righteously and living for God and, and being humble, oh, you're weak. That's not what the Word says. The word says the person who's living in the world, the word that says the person that's doing all these, these, these iniquitous things, it says they are weak. But when we are in God, when we're in Christ, we are strong. And Paul said that, he said, when we are weak, then we in Christ, we are strong. And so he says that in due season, in those seasons where you appear in your mind you're weak, in those due seasons, at that due time, God will come and strengthen you. God will be your strength. Now, also look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. This is what it says. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It, it goes to the thing, a lot of times we say, well, like the people, when you're driving a long distance, they say, well, you go back and ask somebody, and they tell you, you were, you were right there to it. All you had to do was just take one more step, and you would have been right there. Just drive one more, one more block, and you would have been right there. And so the enemy is always going to make it look like you, you're struggling. And in the midst of those times when you're close to what you're getting ready to receive, that's when the enemy is going to mess with you the most. And so when you find yourself in those situations where it seems as though as you are approaching what God wants you to do, what God is designed for you to do, and it seems like you're getting all these roadblocks and barriers, 
That means you close, that God is getting you to the place where he said he's going to get you. And Satan is trying to prevent you from getting there. And, and so understand how long it took the children of Israel to get from, from, from Egypt, once they got out of Egypt, to get to the promised land. Because of disobedience, because of not hearing God, not heeding God, wanting to move away from God and do things their way, a three and a half day trip took 40 years. And so notice, they caused the delay. God didn't delay it. They caused it. Now, God knew it was going to take that long for him to get there. Because when he, when he was at, he said, I'm bringing them through this wilderness. I'm taking them through this so that I can see and prepare them to be worshipers of me and to see if they're going to be willing to worship me and they be obedient to me. And it took them that long because of disobedience because of wicked acts, because of sin and iniquity and wanting to do things their way. That's why it took them that long. And then to this point, the original group, and you're talking about over a million people, guess what? They didn't make it to the promised land. Only two did. And that was the two who remained faithful and believed what God said. That was Joshua and Caleb. Some of the children made it over, but those original ones, the older ones, the they didn't get there. They didn't see it. Because they were consistently looking back and doing whatever and not paying attention to what God said. That's why it's important. We got to stick with him and listen and do what he says do. Now, when we look at this, and just to point out what he said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, and we talk about time being a point of reference. It depends on where you are. So when we talk about that, and, and God said this, he said, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. <laughs> as I said, God will open things up to you and bring it to you when the time comes. And he brought this to me on this time for to share with you all. He says a thousand years is like a day with God. When you look at that, thank you, Lord God, for <laughs> math, physics, everything else. And you look at a thousand years equals one day. There's a ratio that's developed through that thousand year one day ratio. If you take what he said in scripture and you put that to according to years and days and minutes, if you look at what he said in scripture, one day equals 24 hours. There are 60 minutes in an hour. So if you look at what, he, what Peter says and what God says about a thousand years and one day, that means this. One day equals 24 hours or 1,440 minutes for man. To God, that equates to 1.4 minutes. I'll say this again. <laughs> One day, which is 24 hours or 1,440 minutes for man here on earth, time, earth time. To God in eternity is 1.4 minutes. Almost one and a half minutes. So see how quickly, for us, it looks like it's going slow. To God, in eternity, it's nothing. If you look at it from four seasons, we talked about the Ecclesiastes. Each season is three months, which means 90 days. So for us, each season is 90 days. Each season to God is 130 minutes or five days. So we look and say, boy, this has been a long season. To God, it hasn't been long. It's, it's, it's just what he said it was going to be every time. And so we're looking at, boy, it's been a long winter. No, it hasn't. It's been the same winter it always has been that God has set. Everything in God is set. Delivery of a child is nine months. And notice, all that is set based upon the time. Doctors can estimate, but God knows exactly. Delivery of a child is nine months. That equates to 270 days on earth. That's man's time. That time to God is 389 hours or 16 days. So when we're saying, boy, it's taking, and, and Sister Young would laugh because it got to a point, I said, boy, I'll be so glad when my baby come here so I can see my baby. <laughs> I'm, waiting, I'm waiting to see my baby in, 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 in person. And she just laughed at me. But it was nine months for us.
To God, it was only 16 days. And I know probably a lot of people say, oh, I wish it would be just 16 days. We'll have to go through this whole process. But for God, it's 16 days. For us, it's nine months. Now, from God's reference point and from the biblical record, everything was created in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. If man looks at what God said based upon what man said, and man tries to count the time that it took for God to create everything, God did it in six days. Man looks at it, it took 6,000 years. And so that's why people get, well, uh-uh, the Bible says God created everything in six days. That's impossible because you're looking at it from the standpoint of earth and man and time. It took 6,000 years according to evolution and dark. It took 6,000 years for God to create earth. No, it didn't. For God, it took six days. And so when you're looking at it from the perspective of man and look at it from the perspective of God, what is a long time for us is nothing for God. God, why are you waiting so long? It's just been a minute. <laughs> and, and so we, we can't try to, like you say, Joe said, we can't try to find him out. We can't try to understand him because God is God. And that's the way we have to look at it. So from the standpoint of him delivering a blessing to us, him delivering us in the time that he delivers us, somebody might say, well, it took that man 40 years to, to come to Christ. Look at it in their time, it was a few days. But that's why it's so important. Because we'll say this, oh, I got a lot of time. Because you're looking at it from 24 hours a day. God's not looking at it from that time. He's looking at it from eternity and due time. There's a difference between man time and God's due time. So you might say, oh, I got 24 hours. God said, you ain't got but a minute. And that's why I hope you say, you better get to knowing while the blood running warm in your veins. And that's why he said, in a twinkling of an eye, that's quick. It, man, you, you, there's going to be a change in a twinkling of an eye. You'll be gone in a twinkling of an eye. That's why he says that. Because with him, that's how fast it is. And even from the standpoint, when, thank you, Holy Ghost, when Judas was getting ready to betray Jesus, this is what he said. He said, what you got to do, go do it and do it quickly. Because it was just a fraction of a moment. If we move forth, the other thing we look at finally, we talk about this. God gives an assurance of progress for the delivery and that what's going to be performed. That means he gives us information, and they do that with Amazon and other places. They tell you when, it's going, when it was loaded, when it was shipped, when it's en route, when it's the estimated time of arrival, and when it's delivered. That's what they do. So if that's what they do, why you think God doesn't have his process in place? Because man takes everything from God anyway. And he utilizes it to do what he does here. This is why we know there's an assurance of progress or delivery statement. God tells us he's able to be proactive. And he's the only one who is truly able to be proactive. This is what God says regarding prayer. In Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 24, this is what he said. And he predicted this because at that time, remember, men did not go to God in prayer on their own. They had to go to someone else. If the priest wasn't right, the prayer didn't get up, the sacrifice didn't get made. But this is what he said in Isaiah 65, 24, which was Jesus referred to in the scripture in John. He said, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Jesus put it this way. They said, while before you pray, God already knows what you're going to pray for. And while you are still praying, before you get up off your knees, God has already answered your prayer. That means before you get up, the delivery has already been sent. But because we're dealing with eternity and time, what's instant for God looks like it takes a little while for us. But for God, he didn't take a long time. He responded. He responded before we even asked him. 
And so that's how we have to look at that. There's an assurance that God will deliver what he said he's going to promise to deliver. And then the other thing we have, and if we move to our conclusion, we have the confirmation. God confirms everything. Everything. He confirms it. And so that means in every situation, the notification that the delivery shall arrive to its destination or has arrived to its destination is given. What, do, what do, does UPS do sometimes to make sure they can certify that they delivered it to your house? They'll say that they knock on your door, sign it, and say you received this package. That's certification that we delivered it to you and that you got it. Sign your name here. Thank you, Holy Ghost. This is how God set it up. Delivery confirmation verifies delivery of the item to the stated location. And this is what Habakkuk says in Habakkuk 2 and 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. That means I told you it's coming, it's coming. I told you what I'm going to do, it's going to be done. Though it tarry, though it seems like, like the old people say, it moves slow, but it's making it there. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And so when you get an order, what do you know? You know you put the order in, and so what are you doing? You anticipate the arrival of the order, and you wait for it. You don't drive up to Amazon or try to drive up to the UPS. Where am I? You catch the guy on the truck, passing by the UPS guys on the truck. You got my order on your truck? You just don't do it. You wait for it to come to the location where it's supposed to be. And once it comes there, it's certified that you received it. And so what happens? You give signature confirmation. And so that verifies the delivery of the item into your hands, into the hands of the stated person at the stated location. What did Jesus say? Until now, you have asked my father for anything. You have asked for anything. He said, but now, go to my father, ask my father in my name. And when you ask the father in my name, my father will give you what you requested. Because you asked in my name. And so in the midst of it, in order for you to get your delivery, in order for your delivery to be received from God, Jesus has to sign off and say it's okay to, for you to get it. And you have to sign off with your name. And when they check that name against Jesus, that child, person is a child of Jesus. He's a disciple of Christ, which means he's a child of God, which he's received what God sent for him to receive. And that's why they say somebody else's blessing, you can't receive it. It's for them. Whatever God has for you, that's the song. Whatever God has for you, it's for you. The robe and glory he has for you, it's for you. The crown he has in glory, it's for you. The shoes he has in glory, it's for you. Nobody else can't go and get that crown. Can't get that robe. Can't get those slippers. I can't go up there and say, I want Moses' robe. Don't work that way. What's for you, what God has for you, is for you. And so this is what he says in John 16, chapter 24, and it's the New International Version. Jesus says this, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. He says, ask and you will receive. And this is the wonderful part. And your joy will be complete. And so what does that mean? Y'all know what it's like when you get that all the end, and that's the order you've been waiting for. What are you just so happy? You smiling, pulling it over because you got it. And so he's not saying, that's not the kind of joy you're going to have. The joy you have with him is going to be a complete joy. Because this is the problem. Sometimes it might be delivered, and when you open it, it might be broke, <laughs> or something might be wrong with it. And what happens? You have to get a label and send it back. You don't have to worry about that with Jesus. Amen? And so always remember, like the old songwriter said, you can't hurry God. You just have to wait. Trust and give him time, no matter how long it takes. He's a God that you can't hurt. You don't have to worry. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Amen, amen, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you, Father God, for what you shared. Thank you, Father God, for what you've given. Thank you for helping us to understand, Father God, that it is not delayed that is being delivered in your due time. 
And so, Father, just thank you for every blessing. Thank you for every gift. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, and everything that you favor that you all provide. And just thank you for being ever present. And keep us, guide us, and lead us, Father God, as we go forth in the works that you have for us to perform. And keep us, Father God, in the place where we can receive all that you have for us to receive so that we can deliver your word, deliver your works, and deliver that which you have given us to deliver to men, women, boys, and girls to bring them to the salvation of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. All right, children. We thank God for what he's given us, and we ask that God will bless you with the I am that I am as you go forth on your journey, and we'll see you next time.